Six months to go until the presidential election. Will immigration decide who will be the next president of the United States? I'm Demi Virgen with Sinclair Broadcasting in San Antonio, Texas, for another edition of Immigration Crisis, The Fight for the Southern Border. In about six months, the country will decide if we keep the president we have or go back to the previous one. Immigration will be one of those top issues people will be using to decide who they vote for. The Texas border will again be front and center in the news. One of the remote areas along the border that is extremely treacherous and has seen a number of migrants cross through it is Terrell County. We spoke with the sheriff of Terrell County to get a better picture of what he has seen the last couple of months. All right, Sheriff, so tell me about your area there in Terrell County. How big is it? How many deputies do you have? How many people live there? Yes, ma'am. So Terrell County is the 10th largest county in the state of Texas. We have 54 miles of river with Mexico that we share, international boundary. And the county is just over 2,300 square miles. Um, So even though we're the 10th largest county in the state. We only have a population of about 800, but we aren't the least populated county in the state. So I think that's going to go, that that award goes to Loving County. Um, but with that being said, you know, and, and I think you're aware, I spent uh, 26 years with the Border Patrol. The last 11 years were here in Sanderson, in Terrell County, as the patrol agent in charge. I, I ran the Border Patrol station here, um, and I'd still be out there, but unfortunately, we lost our sheriff, Santiago Gonzalez Jr., to a heart attack at the age of 55. Uh, he was also a 30-year veteran of the Border Patrol and, uh, you know, didn't survive. So it was time for me to transition to uh, to this role to continue to take care of the community that raised me. So I was raised here by my grandmother, but so many families contributed to the way I was raised. So honestly, you know, it sounds cliche, but but truly giving back to, again, so many that gave gave so much to me. Wow. Okay. So you know the area. You truly know the area. Yes, ma'am. All right. So talk- go ahead. Mm-hmm. I apologize. No, no, no. Go ahead. Tell me. Yeah, no. So grew up here, graduated high school here. So uh, again, you know, ran this area, so to speak, for for all of those years. And then, you know, had spent about 15 years in the Border Patrol uh, away from home, maybe a little longer than 15 years, 16, 17 years. And, and finally had the opportunity to come back to Sanderson, which is, you know, something I always wanted to do to come back and, and help be a leader in our community. And and, uh, you know, protect our borders. So your backyard was the now ground zero of immigration. Talk to me about that. Talk to me about what you have been seeing maybe the last couple of weeks. Okay. Well, and if if I could really paint the picture going back some some few years, so to speak. So um, when we talk about Terrell County, we talk about the Sanderson Border Patrol Station. And the Border Patrol Station here is actually responsible for 91 miles. They have all of Terrell County plus the, the about 37 miles of the southeastern portion of Brewster County. Um, but with that being said, the activity here continues and, and historically has has been the busiest station between El Paso to Del Rio. And that's about a 600 mile swath of border. And the reason is, is, is truly our, our proximity to Ciudad Acuna. Um, you know, we do have in that, that portion of the border, which is largely known as the Big Bend area, the Big Bend Border Patrol sector, um, again, this station continues to to outproduce others. Sierra Blanca, with its proximity to to Wadas, at times will will you know will be comparable, but but again, just a lot of activity here. So going back historically, about a thousand, just over a thousand apprehensions. Gotaways usually tends to be just above what we apprehend, and then we of course we have what we call the unknown, just groups that that, that do make it through. Because when you have ninety one miles of border. And a border patrol station that you know has about 50 personnel, you can't have situational awareness of all the border. Even back when, you know, with my knowledge of the border, it's just it's impossible. There's just not enough resources to do that. But again, going back to you know, historical being that busiest station, when this current administration took over, um, our apprehensions skyrocketed. And I'm gonna give you the last three years compared to the last year of the previous um, administration. So when you take fiscal year 2020, which was Trump's last year, you compare it to Biden's first year, we had a 289% increase in illegal alien apprehensions. Again, gotaways were just over that. And you and to give you the number, it was about 5,500 apprehensions, you know, approximately. 
The second year of this administration, our numbers went to a 418% increase. We went from just over 1,000 to about 7,400 apprehensions. And again, got away, outnumbered the apprehensions, but, but just by a bit. Last year, we had a reduction in, in activity, but it was still 188% more than that last year of President Trump. Um, it was over 4,000 apprehensions. And again, got away, just surpassed that. Um, so, we, you know, with this current administration, like the rest of the border, we've seen that significant increase. Now, when I talk about, you know, apprehensions, got aways, and then those we just have no idea that cross an area, which we do know that happens, then we have the deaths. Um, historically, we'd have one death a year, but the last three years, we've had 37 deaths. So a significant increase. Um, and again, this portion of the border is the, the roughest, toughest, most unforgiving terrain along the 2,000 mile stretch of border with Mexico. Very rugged. Okay. Um, with that said, and I, I did read the article on the Texas Tribune where they talked to you yes, this weekend. Talk to us about SB4 and, and your right. thoughts on it and what you're going to be able to do. You have five deputies. Yes, ma'am. So, and then, and I know I missed the deputies part and, and make sure because I've got ADHD. I didn't have it as a kid. I've got it as an adult, but I wanted to touch on the, the last eight days. So the last eight days, we've had just over 30 groups out in the area, um, which have totaled just over 200 illegals that, again, just by what we've cut, what we call sign cutting by tracks on the ground, by our technology that's detected them. We've had just over 70 apprehensions. We've got about 55 that we counted as gotaways. And when I say we, I'm talking about the Border Patrol. Um, and then so we still have about 70 something aliens in the county that are out there walking that we're continuing to try to catch. But we have to prioritize them by distance away they are from us, um, ease of, of apprehension, things like that. Going back to the size of the sheriff's office. So the county can only um, afford to hire three. So through Operation Lone Star, we've been able to hire two more deputies in about the last month and a half which has been a, a significant help to us um, just to have that extra resources. But SB4 is something that um, I totally support. Um, you know, this isn't the first time you, the state of Texas has been involved in border operations. Under Governor Perry, it used to be called Operation Border Star before Governor Abbott created his Operation Lone Star. So back in 2008, I spent six months as a border patrol agent assigned to the state of Texas to help coordinate operations. Um, and that was the, what they called the Border Security Operations Center there at DPS headquarters. So I like to tell folks, you know, if, if you go into DPS headquarters, it used to be, and it probably still is, if you look on the wall, there's pictures that are in black and white of DPS troopers and Border Patrol agents working together. So the border operations isn't even, you know, these last two governors, it goes back decades. I mean, Texas has always been Texas law enforcement involved in border security and assisting Border Patrol. That's something that happens naturally. But with that said, SB4, um, you know, it, it is, again, something I favor, I think will be great because um, even if we were fully staffed along the border, even if we went back to President Trump's last year in office when it was 400,000 apprehensions, that's still 400,000 people that got away. Not all in Texas, no, but there's still people that get away. So it's always going to be that that joint operation between whether it's State Highway Patrol, Texas Parks and Wildlife Game Wardens, and then your local sheriff's offices and police departments. Um, it will give us, as I like to say, it's just that extra tool in the tool belt. Um, of course, my jail can only hold seven people here, and, and you can only hold one or the other, male or female, at, at one time. You can't commingle. But I do have agreements with neighboring counties to where I can take, you know, the overflow um, to those counties to, to hold for me. Of course, that will come with a cost at about $60-something dollars a day. So last year, I ran up a bill of about $70,000 in other jails but Operation Lone Star did reimburse me um, the vast majority of that money. Uh, but well, where uh, where SB4 will be, you know, we have the op option to prosecute somebody, but we also have the option that if they choose not to be prosecuted and just take a voluntary return to Mexico, then we can do that. And that's something similar the Border Patrol does. They, they can either prosecute you or another option they have, another consequence, if you will, is a voluntary return to Mexico. They try not to use that one much because they they want to they want to um, what's the right word they want to employ a consequence that that serves as more more of a deterrent. So a voluntary return, you know, you, you put somebody back in Mexico and then they just try to cross again. But that will be a tool that we could utilize 
um, at the local sheriff's office and, and even our sheriff's office, because when we catch somebody or the state catches somebody and they turn them over to Border Patrol, then that overwhelms Border Patrol. They, they're tasked with processing that person now. So it takes their resources out of the field. So that will allow us to take off some of that burden if we were to catch somebody. And even if we chose not to prosecute, just take them back to Mexico. Here, we're taking them two hours either to the east in Del Rio, two, two and a half hours or three hours to the west down in Presidio. So that's going to take them out of that smuggling cycle for a while and would be beneficial. But right now, we just don't have the resources to do it because it's going to require more manpower in order to run a transport van to Del Rio or Presidio. And when you run it two and a half hours one way, let's just say you're there for an hour and two and a half hours back, you know, that's that's more than half a shift for somebody here. We don't have a transport van either. So that's something that that we will have to, to purchase, which we've already put in for under this next Operation Lone Star cycle. And I'm actually quite confident that if, if I had a, an urgent need now that I could reach out to the state and probably get that purchased um, currently. So uh, so those are some of the things that, that we'll have to, to you know, explore and work out. And then there's the whole magistration process. I don't think that's really come out yet to, to where guidance to our justice of the pieces or county attorneys on how that portion will really work. But just having the ability to, you know, take somebody into custody and, and possibly removing them from the United States would be beneficial. If we don't have that option, we will continue to do what we what we've always done, which is make an apprehension and turn them over to Border Patrol. All right. I know I gave you so, a whole lot, but <laughs> no, 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 but that's perfect. I'm glad. So let me let me ask you this. With the law and, and it's a hot potato. Back and forth, right. back and forth. We I, For I mean, sure. we can't even keep up with what's going on. I mean, where do you see the problems? You are somebody that you're telling me you are with the U.S. Border Patrol. Right. Your eye is going to be very different than somebody that doesn't know. And I think that's the fear of some that there will be right. racial profiling going on. Can you talk about that? You know, and you're right. And even as, you know, as Border Patrol agents, and again, 26 years and having grown up on the border, you know, and, and historically it was, we were catching primarily people from Mexico, right? So then they would say, well, you're, you're racial profile Mexicans, things like that. Uh, and, and that's that's not the case. People that we catch, I can go to any city in the United States and point out someone that's here illegally. It's by the way they dress. Um, e even it, some of their, their physical features, meaning what parts, I can tell you what parts of Mexico they're from, but, but it's, a, it's just, they're not Americanized, although they're more Americanized than the rest of the world that's being allowed to come to the United States. Um, and the reason I say that is because I like to make the point that right now, this administration will let anybody in the world in to the United States, except people from Mexico. If you're from Mexico, you still get sent back to Mexico. And if I had my choice, I would rather have our neighbors to the South that are the most Americanized that actually come here to work because everybody I catch here, or I'll say the vast majority, are coming to predetermined locations where they already have family, they have conocidos, where they're going to go go work in the United States. And our our economy relies heavily on illegal alien labor. Um, but get back to your point, uh, you know, so even to that point, and I've made in several interviews the, the point that it's no longer the U.S.-Mexico border. It's just not people from Mexico crossing. It's people all over the world. So when people start talking, well, they're going to racially profile Hispanics, that's not the case because the U.S.-Mexico border, every country in the world is exploiting it to come into the United States. But yes, with some training, I but but with the training, you know, again, if you and clearly on the news every day, they're showing people crossing the river. So if you see somebody cross the river, there you go. But, you know, a law enforcement officer, you can't just pull somebody over because you think they look, you're going to still have to have those articulable facts to build your probable cause to make a stop. Okay. Um, let me ask you, as far as the, the financial side of it, and you just said you guys got reimbursed. How, how much did you get reimbursed this year, you said, from so, OLS? So, so the last three years, we've had about $2.5 million that we've been awarded here in Terrell County. And I mean, I have been out to your county, believe it or not. <laughs> have you really? Oh. Yes, yes, I have. I've been out to your county. And I mean, for people that have no idea, describe what it's like. It, yes, well, and, and so this county, and as I mentioned earlier, the most rugged, most remote, the most unforgivable terrain there is along the entire southwest border. It, and the reason it is, it's it, this is all drainage to the Rio Grande River. So, I mean, you're talking about, you know, hills, creeks, washes. If if something doesn't bite you, it's going to poke you and, and it's going to hurt. Um, you know, it's just, it's 
desert terrain that's full of mesquite and cactus. We are the cactus capital of the world, by the way. So, um, you know, there's just all kinds of cactus and cat claw. So it, it, it gets hot. Um, you know, the, the work that our U.S. Border Patrol agents do out here is second to none because of that. It, it's just amazing to me. Every time I take somebody out or every time I'm driving by myself and I just look, you know, in the, that vast open, well, it looks like flat desert land, but again, it's riddled with creeks, valleys, washes, creeks and whatnot. But um, it, it's just, it, it's rough terrain. And, and that's why I like to say we measure in hours in this area rather than miles because everything's so far away. We don't have a grocery store. We don't have a doctor. Um, you know, we have one restaurant and we have a stripes where I can get you a chimichanga or corn dog. If you come back out, I'll buy you dinner. Oh, my God. OK, so I guess my last question to you would be when you're looking at all of this, when you're looking at us before and you were a federal yes. agent. Yes, ma'am. And, and now you're looking at the fight between the state and the federal government. I mean, what are people supposed to think when the state and the federal government can't get it together to work together? That's a great question. And, and I, I must tell you the. To preface my answer with, look, I worked under President Clinton, to President Bush, to President Obama, to President Trump, and then about a year and a few months of President Biden. Those first four administrations all contributed to border security. They all built fence. They all hired Border Patrol agents. They all added technology. This current administration is doing none of that. They have actually dismantled 100 years of progress. And the reason I say 100 years is because the Border Patrol turns 100 years old May 28th of this year. This administration dismantled 100 years of progress in a matter of about six months, and then they've attempted to dismantle the relationship between U.S. Border Patrol and Texas Department of Public Safety or, or Texas law enforcement. And, and I've, I've, I'm not one that's going to allow that to happen. At the ground level, people continue to work together while while different administrations, whether state or, or federal, battle it out. At the ground level, they work and they get along. But this problem that we've seen over the last three years, easily solvable. And it's by bringing back the migrant protection protocols, the MPP, the remain in Mexico, or we incarcerate everybody. We don't just give them a notice to appear and let them go in the United States. And the reason we have to do that even more now is because when this administration came in, they cut really slashed funding for bed space because most of our bed space we utilize on the federal side is contracted. So they, they've slashed funding. So therefore, ICE has to release more and more people. But again, with, with those two things, this, this problem that we're seeing in Eagle Pass, El Paso, Lukeville, Arizona, and San Diego could be solved. But what's left are the people that are crossing in Terrell County. We don't have asylum seekers. We have those that are crossing illegally, looking to cross undetected. If we encounter in the field, they typically run. If I interdict them on the highway, they typically lead us into a pursuit. Um, with that being said, it's two different issues. One is securing the border. And, and we had a president and we've had presidents that have you know, contributed to that border security, but then we've got to we got to look at immigration reform through a different lens. It, it's off to the side. Yes, we see people that are wanting to immigrate, but again, it's about securing that border. And let's look at pathways to to allow for more immigration for those who want to come here and work, not for those who just want to come here to live. So, what keeps you up at night, knowing what you know? You know, um, I don't sleep a lot. Cause I'm out working. I, I've had the last two years, I've caught more illegals than I did the last 11 years. I work a harder. I work about a hundred times harder for about a quarter of the pay, but I would do it for free. Meaning this is my home community, but you know, let's look at what just happened over in, in Russia with, with that concert and, and those terrorists. Look, we're letting people in that we don't have any idea who they are. They can go in and, and one judge already passed now that illegal aliens can buy firearms or can hold firearms. So now we, we're letting people that, into this country that we don't know their background. We don't know anything about them because they come from countries where they don't have databases like we do on their citizens. Now they're able to buy weapons. And even if that wasn't passed, they could still get a weapon. Who's to say we don't experience something like that. So that is something that is concerning to me. Anything else that you wanted to add? You, you know, just, just the part where I mentioned on deaths, um, you know, 37 deaths in the last three years, 25 since I've been sheriff. I don't care if it's an illegal alien, a U.S. citizen, a good guy or a bad guy. I treat everybody with respect, and I don't want to see anybody die. So, you know, having to put 25 bodies in body bags it isn't fun at all. One more question. Now yes, that you brought that up, when you find uh, bodies, 
what do you guys do? Do you guys bury them and then wait for Texas State to come down to ID? How does that work there? We've been we've been very fortunate that um, all but one have been actually all have been um, repatriated to their families in Mexico, which has been great. There was one that initially we did find an ID and didn't have a phone. He was actually buried in a pauper's grave. About two months later, we got a call from um, the FBI and it found out that the family was being extorted for money. So that smuggler that smuggled that that gentleman took his ID and took his phone and then tried to extort the family for money when he was already deceased. We were later able to do a positive identification on him and repatriate him to his family. From Terrell County, we head down to the Rio Grande Valley near Brownsville. That is where the fight is on right now for a small island on the Rio Grande that Texas is fighting the federal government for control of, an island that DPS took control of from the cartels just a few months ago. Now, the land commissioner says they will not let it go so easily. Well, we received a letter from the Department of Public Safety asking us to declare it Texas because, as you may remember, Fronten Island was part of our in the area of the border that is the most violent, fully automatic weapon fire every night. It served as a 170 acre complete refuge of the cartels. Um, you know, they they were free of any American or Mexican law enforcement because its ownership was in question. And so um the drugs, the um, the guns, the bombs that we found on that island just proved what an issue it was. Lots of cameras capturing fully armed cartel members crossing the island, as well as many other things. And so when we received that request, we looked at where the center of the river was. We looked at what our treaty with Mexico was. We looked at um, old maps as we are the mapping entity for the state, and we declared it Texas. At that point, the Texas Military Department and Department of Public Safety came on, got it cleared, put the concertina wire up, and now we have complete operational control of that mile and a half of the border. We took a 170-acre refuge loaded with firearms, bombs, drugs, human trafficking, and we turned it into a completely safe, uh, none of those things there. We took away the cartel's refuge and we got complete operational control of that section of the border and we continue to maintain that. So we'll just we'll just fight it tooth and nail. We are unapologetic about defending our border, making Texas and the United States safer. I wish the Biden administration would spend more time actually getting complete operational control of our border, which is their constitutional duty as opposed to fighting me. But if they want to fight, we'll fight back. That is all for this week for another edition of Immigration Crisis, the fight for the southern border. I'm Jamie Virgen for Sinclair Broadcasting in San Antonio, Texas. Until next time.